the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcome. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is yet another video for those who are taking linear algebra. You should have recently gone through kind of a review of systems of linear equations, an introduction to matrices, solving linear systems using elementary row operations. Uh, you should know about row equivalent matrices. There are some existence and uniqueness topics that you likely went through. Uh, you should be very familiar with echelon forms and pivot positions. So there's a lot to know prior to starting this. And all of those videos are in the lineup in my linear algebra playlist. Well, almost all of them. I didn't record something for row equivalent matrices or the existence and uniqueness topics because those are usually more theoretical. I do those in a classroom. Now we're going to formalize how we solve systems, linear systems that is, using row reduction. Up to this point, we kind of relied upon our old school algebra just to know how to do things, but we're gonna apply all of our formal language to developing an algorithm here called the re row reduction algorithm. And this is just, like I said, a formalization of the process we have been using. So this video won't be too lengthy, although I do happen to have an example that takes a little bit of time to get through. So what is the row reduction algorithm? Basically, what have we been doing this entire time? Well, the row reduction algorithm has two phases. One phase is called the forward phase, and that basically gets us to row echelon form. And then there's a backwards phase that gets us to reduced row echelon form. Now I have said solving linear systems, but Technically speaking, the row reduction algorithm can be used with any matrix, not just an augmented matrix from a linear system. So please do not assume that you can only do the row reduction algorithm on augmented matrices for linear systems. That is actually not true. You can use this algorithm with any matrix. So how does it work? Well, given a matrix and asked a row reduced to echelon form, we first start with the leftmost non-zero column. Once we have a leftmost non-zero column, you're guaranteed that that is a pivot column. For example, in this case right here, the leftmost non-zero column would be this guy right here. That would be a, our first pivot column. Now that's an awkward looking matrix. Generally speaking, you're not gonna run into a matrix where the first column is all zeros, but that's just a, to showcase the idea that I'm speaking about here, which is just start with the first leftmost non-zero column. That's gonna be a pivot column. Once you find that first non-zero column, pretty easy, right? Then you get a pivot to the top row using elementary row operations. Now, in this case, you have three choices of pivots. You can either choose to leave that there, that'll be our pivot for that column, or you could choose to move this four up to the top row by using a row interchange, or you could choose to move this row with the seven here up to the top row, again, with a row interchange. And that's, by the way, why I write here that you're gonna use row interchange in this step. My rule of thumb is if there's already a one in the top leftmost position, which would be just this guy right here, then I'll just use that as my pivot. Do you have to choose as your pivot the row containing the one in the leftmost position? No, you don't. However, it is often easier to do that. As an aside, computationally, there are times with when a computer will choose to use uh, a row where the pivot is not one, even though there is a one available. That's due to round off errors that can occur. You don't have to worry about that in linear algebra, so we'll move on from here. Next, we use that chosen pivot, this guy right here, to kill all elements below it. Now, that's what I call the kill step, really in a linear algebra course, that's row replacement. So, for example, here I would take negative four times row one, and add that to row two to become the new row two. That would kill off this positive four right here. And likewise, I would take negative seven times row one 
and add it to row three, and that would kill off this element right there. And give me zeros below that pivot. And then we move to the final step here, and you can see that I just changed some wording here because I didn't like how that wording read. So our last step here is to move to the next column. That would be this column right here. And we're gonna ignore the row with the last pivot that we engaged with. So we're gonna ignore this row because it had the last pivot we worked with and all rows above that as well. So if there were rows above this, we would also ignore those. And if you do that, you'll see that I'm actually dealing with a much smaller matrix at this point. It's just this matrix right here. And at this point, remember, these guys will be zero because we we would have uh, zeroed them out in the last step. And so at this point, we're really dealing with just this column and this column being non-zero columns. So that's the idea. Uh, every step of the way, you ignore the row that contained your previous pivot and all rows above that. We should probably see this in action. Oh, by the way, once you do that, you repeat those steps. I think I said that out loud, but I'm just saying it again, just in case I didn't say it a moment ago. So again, you repeat this process all the way until you get down to this final uh, diagonal element or the final row, if you will. Now that was called the forward phase. And so we're gonna use that forward phase to place this matrix in echelon form. Start with the leftmost non-zero column. That would be this column right here. And then we're going to choose one of those numbers to be our pivot, seven, one, or negative one. Well, personally, I like to deal with the one as my pivot, so I'm gonna swap rows two and one. Notice how I wrote that out. I went from left to right. I did row by row. It's a good habit to work row by row when you're writing down a matrix. I also spent a little time just visually double checking that it didn't miswrite anything because that can happen pretty easily. We have chosen our pivot for that first column. We have a pivot column, that's column one. And I'm gonna use that pivot to kill off everything below that pivot. So I will take negative seven times row one, add it to row two. And I will take row one and just add it to row three to become the new row three. And there we go. And I actually spent a little extra time just making sure that I had done all my arithmetic correctly. So I'm highlighting the pivot that we just did. Now that we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and repeat this process. We're going to ignore the row that contains the pivot that we just found and used. So in other words, we are going to ignore this row right here. And we're focusing in on this new matrix. Now, taking a look at that new matrix, I would, and it's not really a matrix, I would call it a sub matrix. Um, we need to choose a pivot for this next column we're working on right here. Well, the best pivot in my opinion would be the four. Now you may not see why that's the case, but if you happen to use that as your pivot, first of all, notice every element in that row is divisible by four. So that would actually be a one, two, six, negative one. Very nice. So if I use that as my pivot, I'm really working with a one. That's really, really a nice way to go. So I'm gonna swap rows two and three right now. And I'm gonna do something that I told you not to do in a previous video. I told you not to combine two different row operations in a single step. However, I tend to break that rule when I am row swapping, in other words, exchanging two rows and dividing one row by a constant. When I do that, it's just easier for me to do it in a single step. So after I swap rows two and three, I'm gonna multiply row two by one fourth to become the new row two. Let me start by moving row two down to row three. At least that'll start us in the right direction. And now I'm going to move row three up to row two. Simultaneously though, I'm gonna divide each element by four. So this zero divided by four, this zero divided by four, this four divided by four, this eight divided by four, this 24 divided by four, and finally the negative four divided by four. That's just a really nice way to do that problem. Now remember, this is our pivot in our first column. We now have this pivot in our second column. We are ignoring 
the rows where we previously had pivots. So I'm just gonna quickly highlight that row right there. We're ignoring that for right now. And we're just focusing in on cleaning up the remaining rows here. I'm gonna use that new pivot to kill off everything below it. Very quick and easy task. I'll multiply row two by five and add it to row three to become the brand new row three. And let me highlight my pivots right there, there, and notice I actually have a pivot right here as well. So there we go, our, all our leading terms now are pivots. They are pivots because in the reduced row echelon form, those would turn into ones. I don't need to turn them into ones right now. I just wanted to get to row echelon form. This definitely is in row echelon form because first of all, if there are any zero rows, they would be at the bottom. There are no zero rows, so you can ignore that statement. All of the leading entries are staggered from left to right. In other words, to get from our first leading entry to our second leading entry, we drop a row and go over to the right, a certain number of steps, one, two num steps in this case, we move two, but it, as long as it moves to the right to get the next leading entry. And then the next leading entry, again, we drop from there and go to the right. So that tells me we have satisfied two of the conditions for this to be in row echelon form. The final condition is that underneath any leading entry, you only have zeros and that is satisfied as well. So this matrix is in row echelon form and we have completed the forward phase, placing this matrix in echelon form. Now, some students would look at this and they say, well, man, it's so close to having that be a one in this position right here. Why don't we just do that? Well, you would do that if you were starting into what's called the backward phase. So given a matrix, row reducing it to reduced row echelon form, which is called the backward phase, we would get that all diagonal elements or all leading entries would be one. And then any column containing leading entries or pivots at this point would have zeros everywhere except for at the pivots themselves. Let me say that again. To get a matrix in reduced row echelon form, we first do the forward phase to get it in a row echelon form. Once done with that, we start at the rightmost pivot. So we're gonna focus in this process at the rightmost pivot instead of the leftmost pivot. In our matrix right here, that means instead of starting up at this point right here, that pivot, we're gonna start this backward phase where we ended our forward phase, right down here. That's the rightmost pivot. We're then gonna use this pivot to kill all elements in the column above this pivot. And again, we'll be doing that via row replacement. If the pivot is not one, which is actually the case with our first pivot in our previous matrix, if the pivot is not one at that point, you can make it one at this time. Now. Technically, you could do steps six and seven in whichever order you want here. I often force my pivot to be one first and then use it to kill everything above. That's just how I do it. But sometimes it's better to leave the pivot as is and then force it to be one after you're done uh, killing everything above it. Anyhow, once you're done killing everything above that specific pivot, move to the next rightmost pivot and re repeat the process. What do I mean by move to the next rightmost pivot? Going back to our previous matrix, once I have used this pivot to kill everything above and forced that pivot to be a one, I would then go to the next rightmost pivot, this guy right here, and I would use it to kill everything above it. And then once I was done with that and changing that into a one if I had to, I would move to the next rightmost pivot, this guy right here, and repeat the process. So let's go ahead and finish that last example by putting it through the backward phase. And I hope you don't mind, I'll actually do it on the same piece of paper that I was using to go through the forward phase. So we're gonna finish this problem out by going through the backward phase. You start with the rightmost pivot, and then you have the option. Turn that rightmost pivot into one and then use it to kill everything above, or, don't turn it to one first, but kill everything above and then turn the pivot into one. And it's totally your choice. 
In this case, I'm actually not going to turn it into one first. I'm going to use the pivot as is to kill everything above, and then I'll turn it into one. So if I'm going to leave that pivot as a negative two, then I am going to take the opposite of row three. In other words, that'll be a positive two. Add it to row one to become the new row one. That'll kill off that negative two. And then I'm going to take three times row three, add it to row two to become the new row two. Again, three times this would be a negative six, add it to six, and you would get zero. So that would kill that off. Let's perform that manipulation. The nice thing about the backward phase is that all the mathematics you do, for example, multiplying each of these elements by a negative one and then adding it to each corresponding element in row one, that has very little in the way of mathematics. Negative one times zero plus one is still one. Zero plus three is still three, and this will still be three, so on and so forth down the line. Now we're gonna take three times row three and add it to row two, and you'll see that these numbers here don't change at all because they're being touched by zero. It's just zero plus those numbers. That doesn't matter. This guy changes by design, negative or positive three times negative two is negative six plus six is zero. And that guy just remains a negative one. Now I'm going to do again that little no no that I said you shouldn't do earlier, which is mixing elementary row operations. I've said in the past, if you're going to do multiple uh, operations at once, they have to be the same row operation. And my only exception to that rule is when I'm row swapping that I can, I allow myself to uh, divide a row by any number I want. Or in this case, uh, when I'm doing row replacements, I'm just gonna go ahead and allow myself to multiply row three by a negative one half once everything's said and done. Notice I did all my previous mechanics first. So I already computed this and this. And now just to save myself some paper, I'm allowing myself to take negative one half times row three to become the new row three. If you do that where you're mixing row operations in a single step, just be very, very careful about your mathematics there. Make sure you do all the other operations first before you apply that negative one half times that third row. All right, so you see that we have cleaned up the column corresponding to that pivot. Now we move to the next rightmost pivot, this guy right here, and we're gonna use that pivot to kill everything above it. So in this case, we'll take negative three times row two, add it to row one to become the new row one. And we don't have to force that pivot to be one after we're done with this because it already is one. And there we have it. Our matrix is in reduced row echelon form. We have our pivots right here. All of our pivots are ones. Everything above and below those pivots are zeros. So this is in reduced row echelon form. That is the completion of the backwards phase. So the forward phase ended there. The backward phase ended here. Comparing the forward phase to the backward phase. Well, if you were working with a matrix and you want to just use forward phase and you get this point, that's a nice clean looking matrix. Not all of your pivots are going to be ones, but that's okay. Nobody really cares about those pivots being one unless you're using the matrix to solve a linear system. In the backwards phase, it is really nice. This backward phase leads to a really nice matrix in the end. Uh, and we'll see in the next video why I say that's very nice. It's a very clean looking matrix, but there you go. These are the forward and backward phases of the row reduction algorithm. Now some notes here. The row reduction algorithm can be applied to any matrix, not just augmented matrices. So a lot of people, when they uh, learn this in an algebra class and then they see this again in linear algebra, they just think, well, you're just using this to solve linear systems. And that's not true. Uh, you will end up in this course applying the row reduction algorithm to non-augmented matrices sometimes, uh, in fact, often. So it is important to know that it's not just for use on augmented matrices. 
In many cases, when not dealing with an augmented matrix, an echelon form suffices. In other words, the forward phase. So in if you're not dealing with an augmented matrix in this course, it is likely that you could just use the forward phase to get to the echelon form. However, if you are dealing with an augmented matrix, uh, you are likely going to go both the forward phase and the backward phase. That's to get the reduce row echelon form. So avoiding mistakes when doing row reduction. First of all, keep your work neat and clean. Notice when I did this problem right here, notice the steps are super clean. I actually outline for myself the instructions I use at each and every step. And this is so that I uh, can go back through if I make a mistake or if I see there's something wrong with the numbers or whatever it is that I can track my process. I could say, well, let's see, what did I do here? I multiplied row one by a negative seven and added it to row two. Uh, what does that mean? And, and did I do some something wrong? It's easier to see your mistakes if you just keep track of the mathematics. Another piece of advice, write matrices row by row. When I say row by row, it means literally, and I've said this a couple times in this video and a previous video, that when you're writing down a matrix, write down a single row at a time. Don't write down the columns. Don't, uh, a bad way to do it is like this. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. The only reason why I say that is because I've seen students make mistakes and I myself have made mistakes writing down matrices when I write by columns, but I rarely do uh, make mistakes, that is, if I write by rows. So I think there's something about that um, writing by rows that really helps out. The third piece of advice, and I mentioned this as well in a previous video, avoid subtraction in row replacement. Instead, add, add negatives. And you can see it in my work here. Notice every single time that I'm doing row replacements, I'm adding rows together. Every once in a while, I'll see a student that will say, oh, take row one, subtract off row two, it's the new row two. The problem with using subtraction is that it often leads to mistakes. So if you can avoid it, just use addition rather than subtraction. Next thing is to always enclose your matrices in brackets. Some people use parentheses, that's fine as well. But the main thing about this is don't just write uh, a grid of numbers without some type of uh, enclosure. Uh, let's see, um, this is the one I've repeated here, never perform row operations of different types in a single step. The only exception I really do here is division uh, when I can. Uh, finally, the last two, uh, combine all row replacement operations that use the same pivot into a single step. You've seen me do that several times uh, in this video already, so it's just a speedier way of doing things. And then finally, never kill off more than one column at a time. This is probably the most important. That basically means don't go through and kill off column stuff from column one and then kill off stuff from column two. I don't even know how you could go about doing that. I would never do that. So killing an entire column, that's fine. But killing two on a single step, that is terrible. I've never seen a student do it, so I don't even think that needs to be stated. Anyhow, I hope this material was useful for you. It's kind of a review, but with proper language used now. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you in future videos. Have a great day. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are. Until you feel at peace Listen close Don't talk too much That isn't cold Sure You may really hurt inside It doesn't justify you To speak too loud and cry